All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Looks like we've got a, a good group signed in, and we'll go ahead and get started. If for some reason you get kicked out and you want to log back in, it should let you just come and join the meeting right directly. Um, but if you notice, I might be letting a couple people in as the meeting goes on, and so hopefully that's not too terribly distracting. Um, but very, very excited. Uh, I don't think there's two things I love more than evaluating cattle and Brahmin cattle in general. So this is about as fun of a topic for me uh, as I could possibly cover. And so for those that don't know, I'm uh, the director of genetics and performance programs here at BRC. And in a previous life, I spent uh, 10 years at Texas A&M being either uh, on the livestock judging team, the assistant coach of the livestock judging team, as well as, um, excuse me, uh, as well as the head coach there for four years. And so got to spend quite a bit of time just studying, talking, teaching, and, and it's a passion of mine. And so hopefully you take something away from this that is valuable and you can plug into your operation. We'll go ahead and get started. First and foremost, if I can click over the next slide, there we go. I think it's important to understand just a few terms or anatomy kind of labels uh, before we even move any further. That way we're all discussing the same features and we're on the same page. And so uh, we've got kind of things pointing at different directions. And if you would just kind of look over a few of those, uh, like for instance, we've got shoulder and we'll talk about all of the joint angles and how they operate. Uh, we've got different things like this arrow here pointing at the full rib. And if you hear me referencing the term just body, I would be speaking of this entire section here. Top line, I would be referencing this entire section here. Uh, but we'll get in much more detail as we go on some of the body parts, but I wanted us to just at least be on the same page to where I'm not using terms of anatomy uh, that are foreign to some people in the talking. So the next slide. All right, selection priorities. And so I think this is as important of a, a slide as you'll go over in the entire slide set, because without a set of priorities or a list of things that matter in order, it makes it really hard to make selection decisions. And so first and foremost, the number one priority, undebatable, and all cattle evaluation and livestock evaluation in general is functionality. So write that, circle that, star that term because it's very, very important. And functionality encompasses two things. One, structural soundness. So that animal's ability to move, travel, handle their feet and legs comfortably. And then the second is volume. And so we want them to have the appropriate amount of internal dimension, rib shape, depth, and length. The next most important priority, and so a selection priority that we've got to keep focused on if we want cattle that are profitable and efficient, uh, is their production efficiency. And that takes into account two things, their moderation of frame and their natural ability to put on flesh. And so that goes in hand with functionality uh, and ultimately controls that cow or bull's ability to perform their specific role in your operation. The next thing, uh, optimal performance, and we'll spend quite a bit of time discussing what optimal performance is, uh, but in general, uh, we're talking about the size, weight, and, and just that animal's ability to grow, but we will specify later on, right, bulls will have more performance than females. Depending on your environment, you might be able to select for more performance, more growth, more frame versus an environment where uh, maybe you don't have the forage availability to make that happen. Then we'll talk about the last two, skeletal width, which will take into account that animal's base width, the shape of their rib, and the natural muscling and thickness. I think those all go hand in hand, and then we'll wrap it up uh, with balance. And the last selection priority that does have value in cattle selection is EPDs, and we will not go over that specifically in this slide set, but if you have any questions, um, about EPDs after the slideshow, or you want to contact me later on, uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions relating to EPDs. But let's get right into it, and we'll start with functionality. Okay, and so functionality I talked about that's that animal's ability to do their job. Can a bull effectively cover country, breed open cows, stay in flesh, and do it again next year? Can that cow stay on a 365-day calving window, wean off a calf half of her body weight, do it again next year? And that's, that's kind of where we're at and things that we think are very, very important. And to make sure that they're doing those things, you've got to select 
for these next four bullet points or, or kind of that formula we've got there. Functional cattle are sound, they're high volume, they're fertile, and they have the frame size to fit their environment. And so you keep those four rules of thumb uh, near and dear, and I think that will serve you a lot of good moving forward in your particular operation. Okay, let's talk about structure. And I will say this is the most challenging and probably subjective part about livestock evaluation for people to understand, but it might be the most important uh, and the most valued skill set because as we continue to improve sciences and we continue to kind of take EPDs and genetic testing further, the one thing that we still have not figured out a way to kind of use a computer or a, a kind of a statistics program to handle, and that's structural soundness, right? There is no number that tells you sound or not sound, and that's why you need to have the skill set developed as kind of a trained evaluator. So let's talk some structure. Let's talk some numbers. The first number that I think you need to keep in mind and it's important uh, is 45. And 45 is the angle that we want their shoulder to be. And I've always taught uh, that that's kind of the pendulum that the skeleton operates from their back on is their shoulder. And so if they're off in their shoulder uh, angle, they're gonna be off everywhere. And so we want their shoulder angle to be at a 45 degree. And then from that shoulder, everything will kind of follow suit. And so if our shoulder angle is at a 45 degree, then you can follow that bullet point down. And typically that knee is gonna follow suit and be set back at an appropriate angle. And as we continue down, their foot, their pastern, all of that's going to set appropriately. And the reason being is we set that shoulder back at the right angle. Next thing we need to consider is their spine, right? And we don't always think of their top as part of their structure, but that's as pivotal of a part of their skeleton is anything that kind of hinges and connects the front and their back half. But I always teach that the top line, we want it to stay level, um, not only from an aesthetic standpoint, but any deviation up or down is a sign that there's some form of a flaw going on lower in the body. And so we wanna make sure that our top line stays soft and comfortable in motion. Okay, and then we talk about their hip design. Right, and we see these two dots. Those two dots would be hook bones here and pin bones here. And we see a natural kind of a tilt uh, to that bull's hip. And a lot of people will teach levelness and we want those cattle to be super, super level hipped. And in Brahmin cattle, there's actually production advantages in terms of, of reproductive function. We we'll make sure those cattle have a little bit of tilt to their hip. But the key, the key to all of the, the hip is making sure the length is right because the length of their hip is directly gonna forecast the length of their stride. And so you shorten up the hip, you get a short choppy stride. You lengthen out the hip, you get a long fluid athletic stride. Okay, the next one is their hock. And we have to make sure, especially in bulls, but in all cattle, that the angle of that hock, it, it has a nice kind of a gentle set to it. We've got a square foot and enough set in our pastern to keep that hind leg operation in function, right? And so here we've got kind of some labels pointing at uh, the different portions of their body and how they function. Let's put it all into motion. So how does it function? I talked about angles, but let's put it in motion. So the first thing I talked about, the pendulum that determines what happens from their back is the angle of that shoulder. And so we've got when I, and I probably should have covered this earlier, the angle of their shoulder. When I say that, what I'm talking about is forecasting the angle from where my mouse is, the top of their shoulder, which would be the top of their scapula, to the point of their shoulder down here on the front end. And so that's their shoulder angle. And if you follow that line all the way down to the ground and you basically put your show stick along the angle of their shoulder and followed it to the surface, their front foot, should land where this arrow is pointing at out here. And so their shoulder angle directly correlates to their length of front end stride, okay? And so hopefully that's something we can start to see taking effect, but as that shoulder works, that front leg can reach out and get as far forward uh, basically as that angle will allow. And then the next thing is that length of hip. And I talked about, you wanna stretch out one stride, stretch out their hip, give them a little bend to their hock and those cattle will certainly be more athletic. They'll last longer in production. Those bulls will certainly have less incidents of injuring themselves breeding cows. Okay. And the 
grand scheme or, or what we're telling you all this for is I want to give you a, a tried and true method for evaluating structure uh, to determine sound or unsound. And it's a two rule process, a two step process that's very, very simple. The first step, and hopefully some of us are familiar with the term, fill their track or meet their track, meet their stride, however you want to word it. But what that means is when this bull picks up his right front foot and steps, we want his right back foot to land in the footprint that his front foot left. Okay, and so that would be rule one. Does that animal fill his track? Does his back foot land where his front foot picked up off the ground? And I think that's a key thing to consider. And then the second rule that is equally as important is does their top line stay level? Because if you see a deviation up or down, like I talked about, that's a sign of a structural flaw somewhere below there. Also, the main issue there is, right, okay, you met your stride, but your top went up six inches. You dropped your hip and got underneath yourself. So did you really fill your track or did you have to uh, kind of have some form of a deviation of in your upper body to make your hind leg meet your front step? And so that's something to consider. But I think that rule will never let you down. And it's a good way of determining sound or unsound. Okay, and just a couple things to consider, right? We talked magic numbers, 45, don't forget it. We'll talk about the foot design here in the uh, slide a little further along, but right, for the, it all to work, they've got to have good square claws and a foot that's even uh, big and sets at the surface square and correct. And so we'll, we'll talk about that in detail. But one thing I'll say, correct lines are good for balance. You see that written in there. And we won't talk much about show ring and look necessarily uh, because this is more designed for just making good cattle. And I think if you make good cattle that are built right, the show ring will just kind of take care of itself. Just like if you breed for structure that's correct, balance, look will take care of itself because naturally attractive cattle that are balanced right are that way because their structure's right. So uh, just a, a little bit of kind of my soapbox things, but take care of the structure and the balance and the eye appeal that kind of will happen on its own. All right, the foundation, let's take them to the ground. And I talked about, uh, we can say the shoulder angle, or, shoulder angle is pivotal, the top line's pivotal, the length of hip, all of that is very, very important. But if they're not good at the surface, it doesn't really matter. And, and there's a few reasons, right, that their feet can be messed up. The first one is built around genetics coupled with environment. Right. And so maybe the, the, those things are growing out of control because they're high nutrition. The surface they're on is not built to grind it down. And maybe just genetically, they're not very good footed. And the other thing that will cause their foot shape to change, uh, both more than likely in a negative fashion, is a, a structural problem, uh, a problem with their soundness that's going on above. And so we'll talk about bowed leg kind of animals or cow hocked animals, but right. You see typically an animal that's bow-legged is most likely going to be short on the inside claw. They're going to have a long outside claw. Um, those pigeon-toed animals, a lot of times, are going to have a, a big kind of a space there between their hooves. They're going to be really open in their claw set. And so that's things to think about. And there's definitely a reflection. But you look at these pictures there on the bottom, and we've got you the BIF kind of standard chart there for foot scoring. And we like to foot score all our cattle and keep up with it because that's only way you're going to improve it, right? If you don't measure it, you can't change it. But we want those cattle to be a five and a five. So you can see uh, a one, obviously that one's too upright, a nine, uh, those feet are too long, we've got too much pasturing set. Uh, one, that, those claws are too splayed, and the nine on the bottom, that's obviously too curled. And so uh, we're shooting for a five there in the middle with maybe a, a one score swing one way or the other that we can live with. Next. Oh, we're going backwards. Hold on. There we go. Okay. So front structure and, and what we see and what's causing all of this. So we've got that bull on the far left in the picture labeled as normal. And I tell everybody, oh, I keep doing that. I'm sorry. There we are. I tell everybody that for this to, to be easily understood or you to be able to kind of read cattle up front, you want to drop a string from that individual shoulder and it should go right through the middle of their knee and split that split of their hooves at the surface. And if they're square uh, and right up front, right, that string should just stay straight from their shoulder 
knee to the split of their hooves. I'll tell you though, a lot of very functional cattle will turn out just a touch. Um, and so it is okay if we have just a little bit of a turnout, uh, but an excessive amount of towing out up front is definitely a problem. And you can see that bull here, it's towing out pretty good. And the bull there is pigeon towing or coming in up front pretty good. And those bulls are both gonna be structural concerns. And, and the reason that both of those bulls are doing that is that is their consequence for the fact that their shoulders too far forward. And so some animals will kind of roll and separate in their elbow. Some of them will come together and really splay out front. Uh, and it, so it's just a, a negative kind of a thing that comes along with their shoulder angle being just a little too straight. Versus uh, the side view, and this is probably my favorite way to evaluate structures from the side, but it is something you need to take into account coming, going, and profile. But you look at this picture, and this is a good picture to kind of illustrate how the shoulder hinges everything. And so we've got this picture where we see the ideal bull shoulder front end structure, and you study that scapula, right? So their shoulder blade were built at 45, and everything that goes on below there is a reflection of how that shoulder is. And so you can scroll over to the next one, and all we had to do was just shift the top of that scapula forward, right? That shoulder blade forward, just a few degrees, right? 10 degrees or whatever it is. And we straightened out that joint there. We've straightened our knee. We've made that animal more upright in its pasterns. And all around, we've created a soundness issue, all because the top of that shoulder is tick forward just a touch versus the one on the right where we tick that shoulder back just a little bit. We start to get cattle, what we call calf need, where they've got too much set on their front leg. And that's not as bad of an issue. The main issue we need to watch out for is these straight fronted cattle or, or cattle that we'd call bucked over, over at their knee, right? There's a few different terms you can use to describe that. Let's move to hind legs. There we go. Okay, hind legs, rear skeleton and how it affects soundness, okay? This is key, and I'll tell you where it's key, bull selection. Uh, not only do we need females built that way because A, Cows got to walk too, and they got to stay sound. And hopefully these Brahmin cows are staying in production for a long, long time. And the other thing is when we turn out a herd bull, we better make sure he's got the right set to his hock, the right length of hip, the right shaped foot. Because when he goes to mount and service a cow, if he's got a straighter hock and a shorter hip, the incidence of him injuring himself is pretty high. And there's a large number of those straight-legged bulls that stifle themselves and don't even make it through one season of breeding cows. And so when you go to pick out a bull, study the shape of their hock, study their hind leg, uh, both agility and how it functions, but study that angle standing still. And, and I promise you'll be able to pick up on those cattle that just aren't built for the long haul. Uh, and then the bull on the right, you see, we call sickle hock. And, and I'll tell you, that is a much more acceptable issue than being too straight. Cattle that are sickle hawked will still usually last and be productive, but aesthetically, it's a little tougher to look at. And as they get weaker on their rear pastern, we'll oftentimes see uh, kind of uncontrolled hoof growth. And so um, you'll see those toes get real long and we'll run into issues there if we've got too much set to our pasterns. The rear view, okay, and that should be pretty self-explanatory, but right, we've got the correct. And so if we drop that string from our pin bones, down through the hock, down through the hoof, should be a direct straight line up and down versus the bull in the middle whose hock sits further out than his hip and his foot. And so we've got those bow-legged cattle and they're, we're just putting a ton, a ton of weight on those joints when we do that. And then we've got the animal on the right, that bull and the term cow hock. Hopefully you've heard that term, right? And that's where their, their hind legs point towards each other. Uh, those are what we'd call cow hocked cattle. And, and that's not necessarily a functional issue, uh, but cattle that come in at their hind leg typically are a little narrower gauge. Those cattle typically don't have as much muscle. There's exceptions to every rule, um, but I'd say uh, the large majority of those cow hocked cattle are just a little narrow and a little flat. Okay, the next important thing is volume. Okay, and we talk about volume. The one thing I'll say that make sure you keep in mind and you remember going forward volume is a three-dimensional measurement it's length it's width and it's height right and i will say beware of the fat and the flat and the deep uh, 
if you're deep and you're flat and you don't have any actual arc and shape to your rib cage, uh, those cattle don't have volume. Those cattle don't keep easy. Um, they're just altered, I guess, by having a lot of white meat laying over their body. And so we want shape of rib. We want depth of flank. We want length of body. All of those things are important. What that does, and I always ask this question to kids at judging camps or whatever it was that I took part in, like, why do we want cows to have a lot of body? And most of them say, oh, that's, that's so they can carry their babies, right? And hopefully we know that that is true, right? That those cattle will have more internal dimension, more calf carrying capacity per se. But the biggest reason is grass doesn't have a lot of protein. So to get energy from grass, they got to eat a lot of it. And to eat a lot of it, they got to have a lot of gut volume. So that helps them consume, convert, and keep on flesh. And ultimately, they're going to be more profitable that way. And so make sure that your cattle have the right kind of shape to their rib, the right kind of depth and softness as well. Okay, functional versus non-functional. I talked this uh, earlier today when I did this at noon. And I said, this is not breed specific. I like Brahmins, but I, I didn't mean for it to be the two Brahmins are functional and the two others are not. It just happened that way. Um, but you can study our two bulls here. Good structure, good body, very functional cattle uh, versus some bulls that maybe are just a little straight, don't have quite enough body volume. And, and you can follow. Uh, I use this black bull on the right as an example. And so if you follow along my arrows. And so what we did is he straightened his shoulder. What that did is he's then way too upright on his front end. And I can tell that he's towing out really bad because I can see both dew claws, right, on his right front leg, which is never a good sign, okay? With that, we have just completely straightened out our hind leg. I didn't draw an arrow, but our length of hip is very, very short. And to top it off, that bull don't have much volume. He's pretty tight flanked. He's pretty shallow and hollow hearted. And, and just naturally not very deep bodied. And so uh, not functional would be my final verdict there. Okay. And then we've got some examples of body volume. And like I talked about, it's a three dimensional measurement. It should not take very long or a trained eye to look at both of these bulls and tell me which one has more body volume. Start up front, right? Boom box, he's got more width of chest. He's got a fuller heart girth. He's bolder in his full rib. He's naturally deeper back in here to his flank. And guess what? It's no surprise, at least it's not to me. He's got more natural fleshing ability. That bull's fleshier. You know, he stays fleshier because his rib cage allows him to eat, convert. He's got room to fit a lot of grass, stay fat, keep working. Versus this bull over here, narrow, narrow chest, and no heart. And when I'm talking heart, I'm talking about this lower part of his full rib where this red circle is, and definitely no flank. And so, that's a big frame, kind of a harder doing bull. And here's it in the cow form, arrows pointing at the same time. Uh, a little hollow, shallow hearted, a little tucked up in our flank versus this cow, boom shakalaka. I'm sure most of us recognize her. Big, big barreled, high volume kind of a cow that's going to keep on flesh. Oh, sorry, Steve, I might have accidentally clicked on your deal, but you don't need it on you. Keep going on to fleshing ability, okay? We'll be real brief about this, but this does help. Uh, this is real world cattle, right? Understanding body condition scores and how we can manage body condition scores to be more profitable. But the thing to know, from one to nine, let's try and keep our cattle at roughly a five and a six, okay? But I'll show you a few pictures just to kind of, oh, wrong way, help you see, okay? And so I always taught students when I was at a and okay, if you think body condition score one, think skinniest cow you've ever seen probably need to get her to the vet because she's not going to make it much longer in that condition and by the way this cow here is not a brc cow not to slander anybody's cattle that is not one of ours that's just a stock photo we found um, but that cow's a little thin a body condition score of a nine if you see that animal you should think oh wow that is the the fattest animal that i've ever seen in my life think uh old ladies obese chihuahua or something and that's what those cattle typically look like but i'd say the cow here on the left at the top is a body condition score one or two right she needs help um quickly and so we would have to supplement her pretty heavily uh to get her where we would want her for breeding and then calving uh the cow here on the top right that's our 392 donor and a cow that just does an exceptional job from a function standpoint 
from a quality standpoint, she's done an outstanding job and she stays good and fleshy like that. Um, but she's about right. Uh, she's five, six is she's probably a six. Um, and so she's at the upper end of where we want them, but in good shape in that picture. And then the cow at the bottom, that's a, another one of Molly's cows. Those are both actually Molly's donor cows. Uh, but she spent some time in the show barn and this was kind of towards the later end of her show career. And she got just a little chubbier. And so we could clean her chest floor up just a little. We could probably see her just a little leaner right here around her tail head. And so she'd probably be closer to a seven. Um, and she calved and she leaned up like she was supposed to. Um, but that's just kind of a, a good rule of thumb or an idea of what body condition scores are supposed to look like. Okay, this will be really, really quick. Which bull's functional, which one's not? Right, I don't think that we have to spend much time talking. Uh, the bull on the right, and that's Peanut, 641 over 8. That bull's got more body depth. He's sounder structured. He's going to last more seasons of service, most likely barring any kind of uh, extreme nature event, I guess you could say. But he's definitely sounder. He's got more set to his hock, more depth of body, all of those good things. Same here in the cow, right? I shouldn't have to spend much time. Uh, and that black cow has gotten so straight in her structure now that you can see it showing up and her top line kind of arching up. She has no belly. Um, her depth of body is, is pretty poor. And so I'd say that cow's going to struggle to function versus 805, the reigning uh, international champion cow, who is what I'd say probably the prototype of functionality as a Brahmin cow. Easy flesh and beautiful udder to top it off. And so clear differences there, hopefully you can see. All right, gender-based traits. And, and we got to keep those gender-based traits at the top of our mind when we're selecting because I've seen um, probably more cattle here recent times in the past few years that maybe didn't represent their gender just right. And I think that's something we need to, to put back at the top of our focusing list. And what I mean by that is they got to be feminine for females. Males got to be masculine. We'll start with the bull, right? And so we want to make sure that that bull is clean in his sheath. And I've got a, a sh kind of a sheath scoring list here on the next slide, maybe. But we want that bull to be clean in his sheath. And what that does is prevents him from injuring his reproductive parts on cactus or, or stepping on it or any kind of thing. We want to make sure we're tight, clean there. And then we want large, even okay, testicles that are good in their circumference. And those cattle that are good in terms of testicular circumference, not only do they produce more semen volume, which obviously helps with conception rate? Those cattle, a lot of people don't know this, there's a direct correlation between that bull's testicular or his scrotal circumference and how fast his daughters reach puberty once they're in production. And so do not forget that. It, it will show up. Uh, and you, if you use a bull, bad testicles, it might be three years before you realize that you've been kind of creating a problem. And so Nip that in the bud right there from the beginning. Make sure you've got good sheep, good testicles on your bulls. And then this cow, uh, that picture is mainly here to show you udder quality. Um, but I'll be honest, I, I don't know if there's really a better udder on a Brahmin cow anywhere. Teat size is perfect, really square on its corners, right? And so we want those to each sit out on those quarters. Um, square, even, really tight and still kind of up close to her her suspensory ligament is strong uh, and then this last little part of her and that that heifer's navel and you'll hear judges you've probably heard them talk about heifer being too long navel at a show or maybe a rancher when he was showing you cows the reason that matters okay it has nothing to do with her longevity per se but that is her forecaster for her son's sheep right so those cows that are long navel most likely going to raise bulls they have too much sheep and, and it's a cycle you're you're perpetuating you keep those daughters and, and it just gets worse and worse well next slide maybe okay there we go real quick we'll go through some other problems like i talked about the one there at the bottom right that's that's what we want that's as near ideal the cow up towards the top she'd be what we'd refer to as way too gathered her teats almost look like they come out of the same hole versus the cow on the right up top, that other red cow, she is what we'd call loosely attached and she does have a very unbalanced udder. And so what that would mean is her back two teats, her back two quarters hang down quite a bit lower than her front two quarters. And what that does is, A, it's gotten long, so it's hard for that calf to get under there. Uh, and a lot of y'all, I know if you've had to deal with some, some maybe nursing or calf vigor issues, that makes it very, very tough. And so 
Uh, the first thing I think to improve cat vigor is improve udders, and, and you'll see that improvement happen on its own a lot. Uh, the cow on the bottom left, big coarse teats, and she looks like a younger cow. And so I'd imagine as she continues to age, those teats will continue to get bigger and bigger and coarser. And by the end of it, they're going to look more like this black cow's teats over here, where those teats have gotten so big that a newborn calf's going to have a difficulty getting its mouth around that teat to nurse. Um, and so you get two options as a rancher in that situation. You either get the cow up, nurse her down, bottle feed that calf or nurse her down uh, to where those teats are to the size where the calf can fit its mouth around them. Or, you know, a lot of big range settings where guys don't get to babysit their cattle as much, that calf's probably not going to make it. And so it's a very, very important thing to focus on because dead calves, they wean light and they don't win any shows, I promise. So focus on those things and help you in the long run, right? Sheet scores. And so one being more ideal than a five. We talked about the, the descent or how low the sheath hangs is very, very important to focus on, but we also need to focus on the angle. So we want a sheath to be pointing more forward versus like this sheath that's a score of a five is what we'd call as kind of pendulous. And it looks like it's pointing more directly towards the ground. Okay. And so we want to keep those sheets tidy with a little bit of a forward angle. Uh, and those cattle will, A, they'll have an easier time getting cows bred with the sheath angle appropriate and they're a lot less likely to get it caught in something and injure their sheep. And then the navel scores, like I talked about, it correlates. Okay, maybe it'll change. There we go. Okay, muscle. It's the first thing people that just start out want to talk about, and it's one of the last things I teach because there are so many things that you've got to get lined out before we start talking about muscle. Muscle, it is the product we sell, right? That's beef. And so in the long run, that is very, very important, but there's a lot of production traits that we've got to get lined out before we start focusing on muscle, okay? One thing I'll say, breeding bulls need more muscle than breeding females, okay? Which makes sense, right? You go out to get your bull to supply the muscle and the width. And in females, we do care about muscle, but we're more concerned with functional width. We want them to be wide framed. We want them to have a longer, more feminine or kind of a maternal muscle pattern. Um, because those really round, bunchy, muscled, bodybuilder-looking heifers, most likely they've got some kind of a hormonal issue. Uh, and so you're going to have some reproductive, some fertility problems as you continue on. If not, uh, you're going to at least probably have some dystocia issues because they're just so bound up uh, from kind of all of that. Next slide, maybe, if it'll let me. There we go. Okay, the next thing. We need to, and I, I've seen a lot of this, and it's a problem in a lot of circles, is we need to make sure that we're still selecting for genuine cattle. And what I mean is cattle that are wide and bold because of muscle, not wide and bold in appearance because they're covered in a layer of white meat or fat. And so selecting genuine cattle, there's a few areas or indicators that I'll tell you will help you a lot along the way. And it's just from my personal experience. And so um, none of this is the gospel. You can kind of see cattle how you want, but this is the way I like to look at them. And so start up front. Uh, and if you want to know if one's genuine real quick, they better have some width and clearance there uh, up front in terms of base width. They better have real chest width. But be careful because in cattle, as we straighten them out, they might be wide from their structure flaws and not actually wide from body width. But you can see this bull is wide there from armpit to armpit and that's where we want actual body width being wide down in their knees doesn't mean anything we want them wide from armpit to armpit okay and then we want to i always like to get around front and study those cattle and if you were to lay a board on their shoulder all the way back to their hip a genuine animal that, that's perfect right and, it, and it's hard to do there will be no deviation from shoulder all the way to hip square and smooth and consistent. I know that's very, very hard to do, um, but we dang sure want them to get wider as they go back. Uh, counterfeit animals will be big in the middle and they'll be narrow on both ends. And so we want that. And just like this rear view, okay? Uh, and this is another one of our bulls, 259 bull that was very, very popular for a long time, reserve national champion, uh, super genuine. You get behind him and I, I've got three air or three lines here put together four, excuse me, but you want the widest part on a genuine animal 
to be this green line. And so that area is what we call stifle to stifle. And so an animal that is genuine and naturally muscular won't be wider here. It won't be the widest here. It won't be the widest in their gut. They're going to be the widest from stifle to stifle. Okay. But we also want to maintain width out of their hip. In bulls, that obviously correlates to thickness and muscularity. In females, it not only has to do with their natural thickness, but it's also going to be a reflection of their ability to calve easily, right? And so we'll have less dystocia issues in those cattle that are functionally wider out of their hip. And then we want width to maintain from top to bottom, okay? But we want them to be widest from stifle to stifle. Also, we got to look more at outward shape to their rib. And I think that a lot of people have gotten kind of comfortable at just judging cattle from the side and not really studying the actual shape of their rib. Because I promise the actual turn to their cage, their rib cage, means a whole lot more than the depth and fill that comes from the hay that you fed them that morning. And so keep that in mind. I really do think that if you learn to judge them as genuine cattle and select for red meat and, and less adipose or white fat there, uh, you're going to improve your cattle. Let's see. I don't know why it's giving me so much trouble to change slides. There we go. Okay. Balance. And I talked earlier and I meant it when I said it. If you pick for structure, you make those cattle sound, the balance will come together naturally. But I think a lot of people have their own definition of balance. Okay. Balance. Lamest terms, right? The scale. Think of it that way. Do the parts and pieces match? And so I always say, cut them in half, right? If you were to chop them in half with those parts right down the middle, weigh the same on both sides. Uh, and, and I think if you did it to this Brahmin cow, our 341 donor, uh, BRC 341, if you dropped the line where my mouse is at right there on her last ribs, that's the worst line ever, but right there, I do think, I think she'd be about 50-50 like they're supposed to be. I think if you draw a line right above her 341 brand all the way across the middle part of her body, I think your top and bottom half match about 50-50, right? That is a, just a very balanced female. She's proportional. And, and she just looks looks right, right? I think you don't have to be trained. You just look at that picture and think that animal looks balanced, proportional, and right. Versus this heifer on the left, this herper heifer. And once again, this is not a breed slide. I actually raise herpers too, and so I like them, but bad balanced, right? Chest to flank, so her, her underline is bad. Her rear half looks like it weighs twice as, or excuse me, half as much as her front half. And if I'm going to tell you the truth, I probably would assume that a lot of that's related to some hormonal imbalance, right? She's just not quite right from an estrogen level standpoint. We're starting to distribute weight uh, in the wrong places. And she just doesn't look like a female anymore. And she's definitely not nice balanced. Okay. We'll wrap up with a couple more slides and then I'll open it up to questions. But Probably as challenging of a thing for people to understand that didn't grow up, spend their whole lives in the Brahmin breed uh, to see, evaluate, and get is breed character. And there's a lot of features that go into it. And so as you go, just continue and trying to learn and master your ability to evaluate breed character. But it's head, right? It's ears, it's, it's muzzle, it's pigment, it's hump shape. Okay. And we'll talk about a few of those things. And we've got some pictures here just to talk through some cattle that I think are good in their breed character. we got some color differences. Uh, we've got the cattle up in the top left. We call those red tinged, right? And I hope uh, y'all know those are gray cattle, right? Those are gray Brahmin bulls, but they're red tinged. And so they've got that reddish color to them. The next bull here, Peanut, and he's almost black, but he's a very, very dark pigmented bull. Um, and then if you, if you see bulls colored like him, real dark, but then they don't have anything around their ear, and maybe their uh, kind of their prepuce or their sheath, they don't have black there at the tip. We'd call those cattle blue. Okay. And so if you hear us say the term, well, that's the blue bull, that's typically what we're referring to. Back to breed character. Okay. Let's talk about head quality. And I think you can look at 160 and he's got that nice general roll. He's got a big masculine kind of a shape to his head. His head screams from and herd bull. Same with Dutton. Oh, sorry. Dutton up at the top right. Good shaped head very masculine, stout kind of facial features. And then you go back from there and the thing I love about Dutton, hump is massive. His hump is shaped really, really good. And talking about kind of half bean shape, I guess, basically. So his hump is shaped very, very good. It's big, set out wide. Um, and then down below, kind of the cow that we would consider to be our ideal BRC breed character, at least, 
We love the breed character, Sweetie Black, shiny nose, right? She's got pigment. She's got a, a very feminine, kind of a ladylike shape to her head. You follow her knee up to her shoulder, up to her hump, and it looks like her hump is sitting there directly on top of her shoulder where you want it. It's not too far forward. Um, and so there's just a few things. <coughs> Keep in mind, sheets and navels also will play a part in all of this. But uh, like I said, it's not one thing I could teach you how to evaluate breed character overnight. But as you start to study uh, cattle at shows and around as you go, uh, certainly something you'll pick up. Okay. And we're going to wrap up with this slide and just kind of an overview or a few things to keep in mind. And I really like this line up here at the top. Okay. And so if you want to keep that in mind, I think it'll help. Um, oh, sorry. But the minimum scrotal circumference there for a bull, 32 centimeters, which if you didn't know that, that's okay. The, the vet will tell you that when he's doing a breeding soundness exam. But we got to make sure that testicular size is right. I'm talking bulls and then I'll talk heifers. Okay. We also need to be aware of any kind of twisted testicle shape scrotum that's turned and twisted because that will show up. Uh, like I said, you, you might not notice it until three years later when you're having problems getting your cows bred you know, because of those daughters you kept out of that bull just didn't have the fertility built into them. Testicular descent's important. Okay, we want bulls to look like bulls. We want females to look like females. And if you take anything away from this outside of functionality is key, but that's also important. Okay, because hormones, right, testosterone and estrogen are basically the same thing, but as kind of DNA synthesizes, females turn it into estrogen, males turn it into testosterone. And so those bulls that are really masculine and have a lot of testosterone, their daughters are actually going to be the most feminine. They're going to be the most refined because the hormones transition that way. <clears throat> okay. I keep skipping forward. Femininity is a must, right? And then the last thing there I'll talk about when we talked about selecting genuine cattle, red meat, beats white meat any day. And so learning to evaluate cattle that actually have muscle and aren't just big kind of fat lards uh, will take you a long, long way, okay? Uh, and then a few profit killers that you need to just kind of keep track of as you go forward, right? Feet issues. Um, and so that's a way for a bull to quickly leave a herd or a cow and not last the full, you know, 20 years you want to get out of your Brahmin care or whatever it may be. Sheets, right? And so uh, I've seen a lot of cattle, a lot of bulls specifically that didn't make a breeding season because their sheath uh, shape was wrong. Their sheath length was off. Udders are the same way. And the last one uh, I'll tell you about and I challenge you to consider extreme frame, okay, in terms of being too big can certainly be a detriment and a profit killer. And study at Oklahoma State I was reading through uh, the other day stated um, I believe after 1,200 pounds for every 100 pounds of mature cow weight you add, you're going to gain somewhere between 30, 10 to $30 for every 100 pounds of mature cow weight you increase. It's going to cost you $42 in land and feed. So for every 100 pounds, you're basically losing $12 a head. Uh, and so keep that in mind. I know that we sell these things by weight, but there's an input and an output, and we got to balance those for profitability. And so more mature, or excuse me, more moderate mature frame sizes, those cows are typically going to wean off a higher percent of their body weight and be more profitable, okay? Um, uh, and then I will kind of leave you with this, this line, I guess, the way I see the industry to work. Uh, and maybe you agree, maybe you necessarily don't, but these cattle are expected to consume convert and ultimately on and perform on an entirely forage based diet. And if we select for production traits that correlate to profit, uh, we're going to last a whole lot longer in this business. And so hopefully you understood some of these things. Hopefully there was something you could take away from this talk uh, that'll help you in your own operation. Or maybe one day when you judge a show, I'll open it up for questions. If you want to type a question, uh, absolutely, you can type it. Or if you want to unmute yourself, please do not hesitate to ask questions. If you're uncomfortable talking kind of out loud, send me an email. Uh, my email is keaton at brcotrere.com. So it's keaton, K-E-A-T-O-N at brcotrere.com. I'm available anytime. Shoot me an email. Love to answer questions. Love, love to teach people. And so, uh, but with that, we're kind of done. So if you've got a question, by all means, uh, send it in. Unmute yourself. Ask it. I know we've got a couple in the chat. 
Um, and yes, this class will be available, or excuse me, this recording will be available. Um, and so I think it'll go on YouTube maybe tomorrow or in the next couple of days. And so we'll let everybody know uh, when it's available if you wanted to watch it again. Okay. Um, and Ms. Beaver asks, how old does a calf need to be to be evaluated fairly? And, and I'd say that is, is a good question and a very hard one to answer. One is everybody's environment's a little different. Were they creep fed? Does the cow milk good? Um, there's just so much. How was herd health? Everything like that's going to affect it. Um, I like to, I mean, I like to make sure those cattle get weaned. Um, get through kind of that rough patch of weaning and on feed and started and going before I start deciding whether I need to give up on one or push harder and, and kind of they're a great one. And so I just kind of let it come as it comes. Don't get in too much of a hurry because that six to nine month range, those cattle will change a lot. Um, and so hopefully that answers your question, Ms. Beaver. Um, can you explain EPDs? I would love to but it would probably take me a whole nother one of these lectures. And so if you look, bearcatrare.com, um, I wrote a, a nice blog, or at least I thought it was nice, uh, about EPDs that made it to where everybody could kind of understand them on a basic level. And so if you found that, I think that would help. And also if you wanted to email me privately after this, uh, I would love to answer that question. I just don't think we have time, but EPDs, Right, it's a numerical value to help you predict that animal's estimated breeding value, basically. Um, and so, well, like I said, that article I wrote can really map it out for you. Questions, anybody, if you'd like to uh, ask me anything, um, more than happy to answer. If, if you don't got questions, that's okay, too. I see we got another one in the chat. When a female has a less than ideal bag, is the thought to get rid of her or to breed her to bulls with hopes to clean it up in her daughters? Uh, that's a very good question. And, and I think that that is a, another one of the, everything about livestock evaluation is subjective. So what you say is cullable offense uh, to somebody else, it may not be. I will say that you can breed around it, but it's all a varying degree. Is it? Are those cattle, I mean, is her utter limiting her ability to raise a calf? If that answer is yes, she needs to go. Um, if she can still raise a calf and you think you can breed around it and make that utter right with mating decisions, um, then I think it's something to consider. Um, but just keep in mind that um, it's going to continue uh, to be less than ideal. It doesn't get better with age. And so, uh, but that is a great question and something I, I think a lot of us probably could think about. Anybody else? If you got one, like you said, I, uh, you're more than, oh, sorry, more than welcome to ask it. I'll stay on for as long as questions keep coming. If not, we can go ahead and end the meeting. Yeah. Keaton? Yes, sir. So <clears throat> obviously we talk about cattle evaluation and that's, that, that's probably from a, a breeding standpoint, but you know, we also put them in the show ring sometimes and absolutely, you know, what kind of like what I'm doing now, I'm in a situation where I'm just getting started with a couple and not really raising them to show them, but you know, I tried it out just to see how it works. And I, I kind of realized early on in the year that, you know, these two, cause they're, they're, they're bred to kill have some good, good genes uh they'll probably make good mama cows but maybe they're just not fit for the show ring and that's okay but then you know one of my two of them like in two months changed so much just blew up exploded and i mean i, I came out first in my class at three shows in a row and you know took a couple of champions and it's like it, it, it amazed me how much ground she made up and it kind of makes me wonder do do you kind of give them a chance? So like on the other one that didn't really get there, do you, do you give them the summer and just see how they look in the second year? Or, you know, what do you think on that? Yeah, and that's one where, I mean, it's case by case kind of thing, but I'm always, I always lean towards the side of give, give your cattle a chance, especially if they're bred, something mm -hmm. you're confident in. I mean, those things change a lot. Once that stressful time of weaning will really set one back. Uh, and it's just hard on them. 
And so if you let them get through that weaning stage, get bunk broke or broke to feed and kind of get going, converting, get their rumen healthy, they'll change a lot. It, um, and so hopefully, I guess, I guess I hope that answers your question, but yes, I would give them, I would give them a chance. Uh, Chris, uh, I'm, I, yeah. I think I've seen that heifer uh, and she's very, very nice, but. Yeah. And, and well, and the thing with, with the other one is that I'm kind of worried about is some of her issues. I know we can clean up in breeding, but I don't know that like, for instance, I don't know that a cow can be, become more powerful. Right. Um, that kind of is what it is. So not in that. Uh, yeah. I mean, they can appear more powerful, right? Yeah. Everything's already there, but you can flesh them up to where it will appear more powerful. But yes, you're right. I mean, width is width. That's the width they're going to have their whole life. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, and then Julie asked me a question. Do you have a picture um, of a female hump size that's the proper size? I mean, this have for 75 here on the screen for kind of where she's at age-wise. That's a good sized hump. Um, and then you saw the sweetie cow on the previous page. She's got a kind of a hump that's the right size and placement. If you wanted to look uh, on our BRC websites, BRC Sweetie 486 is her number. Um, and so you can look at her. Uh, okay. <coughs> Tiffany asked us, can you explain more about the feed issues? Okay. Um, I guess... Tiffany, if you could type in just a little more specific what you wanted to know, I could really narrow that down. Um, but it's a, it's a problem that a lot of breeders and people buying cattle have, have kind of run into here over the past 10 years. And so we've definitely got to focus on making sure that those cattle are, are good in their claw shape. And by that, I mean, each toes, each part of their foot is even, okay? And there's no curl, right? They're, they're growing towards each other or where maybe eventually they'll overlap each other. Those cattle will flat out just not be able to function. They won't move. It'll hurt them to go everywhere because their feet grow over the top of each other and they'll click when they walk. It's a bad, bad deal. And so um, just something to watch for. But uh, Tiffany, if you've got more questions, email me and I, will, I can give you as much info uh, as you possibly want on that. Oh, sorry, Bryson. Uh, didn't mean to call you. Tiffany the whole time. Um, and then Jeremy asked, uh, where does docility rank at BRC in importance? High, very, very high. Uh, and there's, there's really no forgiveness for cattle uh, that are hard to be around. And frankly, life's too short, right? It, it, it's not worth getting somebody hurt or, you know, you're going to see profit loss when those cattle have temperament issues. They don't gain as good. Um, research says, and you'll have everybody that says, well, my crazy one gets bred every time, but research says that there is a negative impact on growth. And there's also a negative impact on fertility when we see those cattle that are, are basically they're in high stress all the time because their docility is off. But uh, that's us. Uh, and that's kind of something we're very, very strict on. Y'all are very interactive, and I appreciate that. If there's any more questions, no, I will answer them. If there's not, um, I understand, too. Bryson, did, did I answer your question? What Do you got anything else? Okay, perfect. Thank you, Bryson. Okay, perfect. Well, I appreciate everybody signing on. And if I missed a question or I, I, you didn't get the opportunity to talk, email me, Keaton, K-E-A-T-O-N at brcotrer.com. I will answer you, I promise. Um, look forward to hearing from you guys with any kind of questions. And so y'all have a good, good night. Thank y'all for joining. Take it easy.